afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Dionisia Ramos. I am the Vice Chair of the Center for Latin American Studies. And I am very pleased today to be introducing to you all Professor Kenneth Roberts, who's with us today. Um, he will give us a brief presentation, about 30 to 40 minutes, and then you'll have a chance to ask questions immediately after. And I think from who I see in the room, you all are probably pretty familiar with his work. But for those of you who are not, he is a professor of government and uh, director of the Institute for the Social Sciences at Cornell University. He teaches comparative and Latin America politics with an emphasis in the um, political economy of development and the politics of inequality. And he's the author also of several books, including uh, The Resurgence of the Latin American Left. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kenneth Ross. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and stand here. Uh, let me say, we, we spell university different at Cornell than the way it's, it's spelled in, in most places. I, I just noticed that. I thought, huh, something, something is missing there. But, uh, but no, I, 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 that's right, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's great to be back at Berkeley. I was telling Ruth, I think I, the last time I was here was way back in 98 at a workshop that she had organized on labor politics. Um, so it's, it's been a while, and it's nice to, I haven't seen sunshine in a while, quite a, quite a while, actually. So it's, it's sort of sort of blinding when you come out here, when you live in the part of the country that I do. Um, anyway, today I, I want to talk about work that I've been doing on party systems and political representation in Latin America, trying to understand basically the impact of the, the process of market reforms in the 80s and 90s on political systems, on, on party systems in particular in the region, and uh, trying to understand why why it is that some countries made the transition from the, um, from the import substitution industrialization model of development to the free market model and then beyond with relatively stable forms of politics, whereas other countries uh, have had extremely high levels of electoral instability and in some cases complete breakdowns of party systems. So I, I want to start with well, you know, what is you know, in some ways a, a key puzzle, I think, in, in Latin American politics, which is that the new democratic regimes in the region uh, the so-called third wave of democratization, the new democratic regimes have really been remarkably durable and, and resilient. If, if you look at the historical record in, in Latin America, of course, you get this pendular cycle between authoritarianism and democracy. You go back to classic work on democratic transitions, uh, Spinner and O'Donnell and others, the, you know, the title of their book was Tentative Conclusions About Uncertain Democracies. And the notion of the fragility and the insta potential instability of the democratic regimes was very central to our thinking about democratization as it was taking place in the 1980s. And I think most observers would say that the new democratic regimes in the region have really been uh, more stable and resilient than what anybody anticipated at the time. Nevertheless, um, we see in a lot of countries remarkable fragility and instability in the party system, so sort of the, the key representative institutions of liberal democracy. And so there's a puzzle here as to why it is that the democratic regimes have been very stable and yet party systems often much less stable. And so I want to try to, to make sense of that as I go forward. So I think one of the questions you get here then is, you know, whether there's a crisis of representation in democratic regimes in contemporary Latin America. Um, and so I'll play a little bit off of Mainwaring and Zoko. They had an article a few years ago that, that talked about uh, sort of the, in, the intrinsic fragility and volatility of party systems in the so-called third wave. Uh, according to Mainwaring and, and Zoko, they make an argument about the importance of historical sequence and timing effects um, and uh, argue that this is part of the instability of party systems in the so-called third wave. They argue that mass party organizations that were grounded in social cleavages uh, and where you ha had very strong organizational and bureaucratic development of political parties, that this really belonged to an earlier stage of political development. Uh, so their argument was that party systems formed earlier in the 20th century developed uh, much stronger social bases, stronger mass organizations, whereas party systems formed during the third wave of democratization tend to have much shallower social roots. They tend not to be deeply anchored in social cleavages and tend to have much shallower party organizations. Um, and so they talk then about the impact of structural changes in the economy, the sort of the, 
uh, sort of the fragmentation of labor markets and how that you don't get the strong social cleavages underpinning party systems. They talk about television and other mass communication technologies that alter the ways in which political parties try to mobilize the electorate so that you don't really need strong grassroots party bases, but you can use uh, television and other forms of mass communication technologies. So their argument then, in a sense, was if for countries that are going through democratization in the 80s and 90s in the third wave, if you're forming party systems at that time period, that you sort of miss the boat for having strong political parties. If you didn't form the political parties earlier in the 20th century or in the European case in the 19th century, if you didn't form those strong parties during earlier cycles of democratization, you were very unlikely to get strong political parties emerging uh, during the third wave itself. Um, I think there's some truth to their arguments, you know, and they present some statistical work that demonstrates it as, as a general pattern that there is, you know, some empirical evidence to support their argument. But nevertheless, I, I think their argument is ultimately too, it's, I think it's too deterministic, uh, that it tends to mask a lot of variation among both the older and the newer party systems when you look at Latin America. In Latin America, you can see countries that, that did form strong mass-based party organizations during earlier stages of democratization, Venezuela in particular, uh, but Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, we see complete breakdowns of party systems that were older, uh, that were formed during earlier uh, periods of political development. We also see I think in at least a couple of cases, the gradual consolidation of what really were brand new party systems formed during the third wave of democratization in the 1980s. Um, so Brazil, you know, we still sort of think of Brazil as being very volatile and, and fragile as a party system, but in comparative terms, they've actually been very stable since the mid-1990s. Uh, mid or El Salvador, which came out of the Civil War with a brand new party system, uh, which has been a, a very stable party system within the region. So, so in other words, I argue that this deterministic argument about the importance of historical sequence and timing effects, uh, that it doesn't really capture a lot of the variation that we're seeing within the region of Latin America today. So what I've doing, tried to do in my work is to, to develop an alternative argument that really looks at the political dynamics within the third wave of democratization itself and tries to understand what is happening there that leads to this variation in, in party systems. Right? So ultimately I argue that the politics of market liberalization in the 1980s and 1990s that it undermined party systems in, in much but not all of the region. And I argue that this, this transition from the ISI model of development to market liberalism really was a new critical juncture, not just, uh, not just in the economic development models, but also a critical juncture politically within the region. So I, so I argue that this, this basic shift in the development model was both an economic watershed and a political watershed within the region. And I argue then sort of the, the key point is that this, tra uh, this economic transition, it programmatically aligned or de-aligned party systems in fundamental ways around the process of market reforms and that this process of alignment or de-alignment had important long-term legacies uh, for party systems within the region. All right, so I argue then that this process of alignment or de-alignment during the critical juncture that had shaped the stability of post-adjustment party systems, post-adjustment meaning uh, the, the party systems after the process of market-based uh, market structural adjustment. I argue that it also shapes the political expression of opposition to market liberalization, which as I'll talk about intensifies in the, the so-called aftermath of the critical juncture. All right, so in particular it shapes whether or not uh, this, uh, this opposition is expressed through mass social protest or through partisan competition. And ultimately then I argue that the critical juncture also shapes the nature of the political shift to the left that occurs after 1998 within Latin America. Whether or not this transition, uh, the this, this strengthening of leftist alternatives occurs within or outside and against established party systems. Right, so I'll argue then that these are all part of the legacies of the critical juncture with, within the region. All right. Um, so before I sort of go into the critical juncture argument, I just want to talk a little bit, sort of come back to this notion of a crisis of political representation within Latin America. I'll give you, show a little bit of evidence that tries to, you know, to, to demonstrate what we're talking about here. And for some of you, I think this, some of this data will be familiar. Um, but uh, in general, when you look at Latin American citizens, they tend not to have confidence in political parties. They tend not to identify with political parties and they tend not to vote in a stable manner for political parties. Just a little bit of the evidence, if you look at confidence in national institutions, as you see political parties rank last, 
this is not that unusual in a lot of other parts of the world. You, you find similar kinds of, of data. Uh, but clearly, most people don't have any particular trust or, or confidence in political parties. This is from the Latino Barometer surveys. If you look at party identification across the whole region, uh, you can see a lot of variation here. Uruguay actually ranks highest, slightly above the United States. Dominican Republic is not too far below. Costa Rica still relatively high. But once you start moving downward, you see very low levels of identification with political parties. All the way down, you know, at the bottom, sort of the countries, for the most part, that you would expect. Peru, Argentina, Guatemala, Ecuador, very low. The surprise case, of course, is Chile, which we think of as having a very strong and, and has been electorally a very stable party system. But Chile actually ranked last. This is from the America's Barometer Survey uh, done uh, by Vanderbilt a couple of years ago. All right, so the, the Chilean case here raised some eyebrows. And the Chileans are sort of scratching their heads trying to understand you know, why this very stable party system ranks so low in terms of party identification. You also find that the surveys, the majority of citizens prefer not to vote for political parties. If you ask them, would you rather vote for a party or for some sort of nonpartisan alternative, some independent personality, it's <coughs> roughly 50-50. Roughly it goes up and down. But a lot of citizens say that they would prefer not to have to vote for a political party. When they do vote, of course, what you find is that partisan preferences tend to be unstable. Right? So on average, you see very high levels of electoral volatility. Volatility simply meaning the, the aggregate shifts in the vote from one election cycle to the other. If you look in comparative terms, compared to the United States and Western Europe, Latin America has very high levels uh, of electoral volatility. Uh, compared to Eastern Europe, Steve Fish can tell us more about the Eastern European cases. Eastern Europe actually has higher levels of volatility. But you have to keep in mind, in Eastern Europe, you really do have brand new party systems that are forged after the collapse of communism. Whereas in Latin America, you've got party systems that have been around, in some cases, since the 19th century, in other cases, since early, earlier stages of democratization in the 20th century. But to have this level of instability in both presidential and, uh, and legislative elections um, in countries that, have, that really do have or did have longstanding party systems, it's, it's quite striking. Go ahead. Sorry, um, what period does this uh, index have? This is, I forgot to put, this is, um, it's basically during the third wave, the period of the third wave. So if you look at the 80s, 90s, um, and then the, uh, and the first decade of the 20th century. Right? So this is essentially during the period of the third wave. What's, what's also striking in Latin America is that this volatility is increasing over time. And this should not be what you would expect. I mean, if you go back to the 80s, you know, it's not surprising you'd have you know, unstable elections in Latin America in the 80s. You've got new democratic regimes after military regimes in many countries. You had long-standing interruptions in, electoral comp in, in partisan and electoral competition. You've got a whole new generation of citizens that are being incorporated politically in the 1990s after long periods of authoritarian rule. So you, you would expect a certain level of instability in the 1980s. You would also expect, of course, with the debt crisis of the 1980s, you know, in periods of, of tremendous economic crisis, you get widespread anti-incumbent voting and high levels of volatility. So it's not at all surprising that in the context of the 1980s, you would have high levels of electoral instability in Latin America. What's surprising, however, is that volatility has actually continued to go up in the region since the 1980s. So it was higher in the 90s than it was in the 80s. And it's been higher in the first decade of the 21st century than it was in the 90s in both presidential and legislative elections. All right, so in other words, what we're not seeing in Latin America is where party systems are consolidating over time over the course of the third wave. Right? You don't see voters becoming socialized or what, you know, what they sometimes call habituated to support established political parties. You see high levels of party switching and voting for, for, uh, for outsider candidates or for new political parties. Um, and so there's the kinds of institutionalization and consolidation of electoral competition that you would expect over time uh, has, for the most part, not been taking place. I think it has been taking place in some countries, but it has not been the general pattern. Nevertheless, of course, you find tremendous variation. This may not be visible in the back of the room, but if you look at all the different countries in Latin America, what you find is, is huge variation in, uh, from one country to another in terms of whether or not you have relatively stable electoral competition. The most stable, surprisingly, is Honduras. That's going to change. I'll go out on a limb. Honduras' party system is about ready to break down. But it, they have been the most stable 
party system in the region during the third wave. Next, surprisingly, is El Salvador coming out of the, uh, coming out of the Civil War. Uh, Uruguay, quite stable. Chile, relatively stable. A uh, number of countries in the middle. And then, of course, you've got the cases with exceptionally high levels of volatility. Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Guatemala, Bolivia down at the bottom. All right, so at the, at the very top, you get countries that are not all that far from a European or a US model uh, or pattern of stability. Uh, but down at the bottom, you have countries with tremendous instability. And for the most part, you, you know, the countries at the bottom have generally seen a complete breakdown of the established party systems. All right, so the question then is, why is it that you get uh, relatively stable patterns of electoral competition in some countries, but not in others, right? So the key argument that I'm making is about, uh, here's the, the, Ruth doesn't like this concept, neoliberal critical juncture, so we can, we can debate it whether or not, you know, she says I need to come up with a political concept rather than an economic one, so we can, you know, I'll let her push me on that a little bit. All right, but the argument I'm making is that the transition from the ISI model of development to neoliberalism in the 1980s and 90s, not just an economic watershed, but also a political watershed, that it's a new critical juncture in the region's political development. It undermined the representative institutions that were embedded in the ISI model of development, in particular the labor-based modes of uh, partisan and union representation and the linkages that were established historically between unions and parties. And it also culminates in a social backlash in the post-adjustment period, a social backlash against market insecurities and that this social backlash then plays a role in, in realigning and stabilizing some party systems in a small number of countries, but it de-aligns de and de-institutionalizes party systems in much of the region. So I'll try to walk through the logic of the critical juncture argument a, a little bit as we go here. First, just quickly showing, uh, you know, sort of the aggregate process of market liberalization within, within the region uh, from the Structural Reform Index. Uh, you know, and it shows different indicators, capital account liberalization, trade, financial liberalization, uh, and the upward trend means countries moving uh, in general towards freer markets. And you see in particular from the mid-1980s from the mid on, this is really the classic period where the whole region is moving away from heterodox and statist models of development towards freer markets. So that's just the, the regional average on those different indicators, okay? In terms of the critical juncture argument, there, there are really three different stages that you find. Um, and I, I'm speaking here at, at Berkeley where, you know, critical juncture arguments have, have been developed more than, than any other place perhaps. Um, but in thinking about critical junctures, you have, first of all, the antecedent conditions. I'm not gonna say much about that today, but there are really two antecedent conditions that play a role in the larger story that I'm telling. First is the nature of the party systems that developed in the ISI era, whether you had what I call elitist or labor mobilizing party systems. Um, and sort of the bottom line there, countries that had labor mobilizing party systems suffered by far more severe economic crises as the ISI model collapsed. They were, they were countries that were more deeply embedded in the ISI model in general and they had some more severe economic crises, including all the cases of hyperinflation occur in countries that had what I call labor mobilizing party systems. So the economic crisis is more severe and at least the short term political disruption is more severe in the countries that had labor mobilizing party systems. The other antecedent condition is the nature of the military regimes in the 1970s and how they shaped the configuration of political power in the, uh, in the, the after the transitions to democracy. And with, this becomes important because, uh, especially in the Southern Cone, where you have military regimes that either led the process of market reforms, as in Chile, or empowered conservative civilian successors in ways that they would lead the process of market reforms, as in Brazil and Uruguay, um, you get a certain alignment within the process of, uh, of neoliberal reform uh, that I argue is highly aligning for party systems, where you had military regimes that did not empower conservatives to lead the process of free market reforms in the 1980s, you get a very different dynamic. All right, so I'm not gonna say more about that, but the antecedent conditions do become part of the story for understanding what happens during the critical juncture itself. But the key thing I wanna talk about is the, the critical juncture of the, the 1980s debt crisis and the adoption of structural adjustment policies. This is conditioned in some ways by the depth and the severity of the crisis, but more important, where I really want to concentrate is trying to understand the political alignments that exist around the process of market reforms. All right, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then I'll try to understand the third stage, the aftermath period, 
I argue that the aftermath period in the region essentially begins by the middle of the 1980s, uh, to, excuse me, the middle of the 1990s to the, to the late 1990s. Brazil was the last country to, to stabilize in a context of hyperinflation in 1994, 1995. And really thereafter, I argue that sort of the, the peak period of market liberalization comes to an end and the aftermath period politically begins by the late 1990s throughout the region and the political dynamics shift considerably. All right, so the argument then is that what happens in the critical juncture in the 80s and the first part of the 1990s heavily conditions the way in which this aftermath unfolds starting in the late 1990s. All right, the aftermath period is where you get the, the so-called reactive sequences, right, which is the, essentially driven by the development of societal resistance to market orthodoxy. This becomes heavily conditioned by whether or not the critical juncture programmatically aligned party systems or de-aligned party systems during the critical juncture. Okay? And, and ultimately then I argue that, that coming out of the critical juncture you get different institutional legacies uh, of the process of market reforms, right? The political alignments during the critical juncture uh, are determined by who led the process of market reform and whether or not you get a major party of the left in opposition during the period of free market reforms. All right, so ultimately then the institutional legacies, whether you get stable or unstable partisan competition in the aftermath period is conditioned by this, you know, what is ultimately a, a fairly simple, a fairly simple dynamic, right? Do you have conservatives leading the process of free market reforms or do you have uh, a, a traditional populist party or some other kind of political actor that is, that is leading the process? So I'll try to walk through how this takes place. Ultimately, I argue that there are three different kinds of critical junctures within the region. There's an aligning pattern, which is where market reforms were led by conservative actors and you had a major party of the left in opposition. All right, so this includes, I put up here the cases that I include here. Chile, this takes place under the military dictatorship. In the other cases, key reforms being led, uh, essentially the critical juncture unfolding under civilian political leadership after transitions to democracy in the 1980s. So Chile is a, is, is a distinctive case because the critical juncture essentially occurs under the Pinochet regime. Elsewhere, it takes place under democracy. All right, so I've got the countries then where you have conservative actors who lead the process of market reform. You have a, what I call a neutral pattern, which is where conservative actors lead the process of market reforms, but there's no major party of the left in opposition. So I list the countries there. And then you have what I call the de-aligning pattern. And the de-aligning is sort of a bait and switch dynamic where you get reform led by a traditional populist or center left uh, actor, uh, as, you know, parties that historically stood for, you know, for status models and in many cases were architects of the old ISI model of development. Uh, the Peruvian case is not a party but it's the Fukimori regime who does, who does the bait and switch, running as a populist figure and then implementing the reforms. But the other cases you had uh, some sort of traditional populist or center-left political party leading the process of reforms. The Mexican case is a little complicated because it begins bait and switch, but I argue that Mexico becomes aligning when the PRI splits and the PRD becomes a major party of the left and the, and the PRI essentially becomes a more conservative party. So Mexico starts in one camp, relocates. I, I won't say more about that now, but we can talk about individual cases <coughs> as we go. But then these are the three, the three basic patterns that I argue take place within the critical juncture. It either aligns or de-aligns the party systems where you get the, the neutral pattern in between, right? In the aligning critical junctures, what are the dynamics? Essentially, in these countries, you get electoral competition between established political parties that take programmatic stands in support and opposition to the neoliberal model, all right, so you've got conservative parties leading the process of market reforms. You have a well-defined left in opposition, the Chilean socialists. You've got the PT in Brazil. You've got the Frente Amplio in Uruguay. You've got the FMLN in El Salvador. So you've got a well-defined party of the left consistently in opposition. In these cases, societal resistance to market orthodoxy gets channeled into the party system and is articulated by established parties of the political left. And it creates a legacy that I call contested liberalism. All right, kind of where you get free market reforms, but it is politically contested, uh, and eventually the contestation leads to a, a strengthening of the institutionalized parties of the left, and eventually in all of these countries except Mexico, uh, the left, the Dominican Republic is a little, a little bit different here, but basically the left comes into, comes into power in these cases uh, through some sort of institutionalized process of political contestation. So the PT, the Socialists in Chile, the Frente Amplio, the FMLN. All right, so the societal resistance gets channeled into the party system where you get these aligning critical junctures. 
All right, and the cases that have neutral and de-aligning critical junctures, it's a dynamic that I call neoliberal convergence. Essentially, where all the different, all the major political parties either participate or support the process of market liberalization. There's no established alternative to the neoliberal model within the party system. And in this context, you don't really get well-defined programmatic competition that takes place within the party system. In these countries, the societal resistance to neoliberalism often gets expressed through mass social protest and or electoral support for, for outsider candidates, some sort of alternative populist figure. All right, so what is, how does this matter then as you get to the, to the reactive sequences in the aftermath period? I argue that as you move into the late 1990s, once essentially once you stabilize hyperinflation by the mid-1990s in the region, the political dynamics begin to shift. And you begin to see a strengthening of societal resistance uh, to mar market orthodoxy. You see it in public opinion. You can see it in the outbreak of mass social protest, which is largely concentrated in the, in the cases that go through bait and switch reforms. I'll say a little bit more about that. But Venezuela, Ecuador, Argentina, and Bolivia, the cases, all the cases where you get ex social explosions that bring down precedents take place in, this, in the, the bait and switch category where you had de-aligning market reforms. You also get electoral upheaval uh, in these non-aligned party systems. And of course, eventually you get a political shift to the left where you get presidents elected in 11, 11 different countries uh, that are left of center within Latin America since 1998 in the aftermath period. Right, so there's a little bit of data to show some of these dynamics. First, if you look at public opinion, as you're trying to understand sort of the, the development of social resistance, uh, sort of the politicization of the social, de social deficits of the neoliberal model, you can see that, you know, when you ask Latin Americans what is the most important problem you face, unemployment has consistently ranked at the top until just recently it's come down, you know, with the economic boom in recent years. You see unemployment concerns dwindling and concerns over crime and insecurity going up. But unemployment has consistently ranked as a, as a major concern in the region. You also see that overwhelmingly in public opinion polls, Latin Americans think their societies are unjust. Uh, they say that the distribution of income in their society is unjust. Close to 50% say it's very unjust, and another 25 to 35% uh, consistently saying that it's, that it's unjust. Right? So basically, Latin Americans, they, they conceive of these structural inequalities as not being fair. Uh, when you look at global economic inequality, of course, uh, this is the Gini index of inequality. Actually, it doesn't show up well. Um, on my screen, the Latin American countries are sort of bright red and orange, uh, which are the highest levels of, of inequality. Countries that are, that are green and yellow uh, have much lower levels of inequality. So part of what takes place in the aftermath period is a growing politicization of these inequalities within the region. You also find in public opinion polls there's been dwindling support for core elements uh, of the neoliberal model. If you, if you simply ask citizens, do you support a market economy, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not terribly impressive. A majority of citizens support a market economy, uh, but in, you know, in a context after socialism collapsed, what's the alternative to a market economy? I mean, it, it, and, and so you know, what you see is that you know, fairly lukewarm uh, kinds of support for a market economy. Also, support for privatization policies steadily dwindled um, at the, you know, uh, in, this, in the aftermath period. It came back up again as the economy rebounded um, and, you know, before the, the meltdown in, in 2009. But basically, dwindling support for some uh, some uh, elements of the neoliberal model. It's also striking in the region, compared to the United States, if you ask citizens, do you think that the state or the private sector uh, and the marketplace should you know, be performing uh, certain central economic roles? I was surprised when I, when I first saw this data because, I mean, it shows how strikingly statist Latin American citizens really are. So whether you're talking about ownership of major industries or job creation or health care or citizen well-being, what you see is that Latin American citizens consistently expect the state to play a central role in providing uh, for those kinds of goods. Um, so again, this is a context where what you see in the aftermath period are those kinds of concerns becoming increasingly politicized once the region has, has stabilized economically. Uh, and you also see, in terms of support for privatization, whether you're, this, this shows different, different sectors of the economy, oil and gas, telephones, as well as pensions and electricity. Uh, and, and all of these, what you see is three to one to four to one majorities supporting a heavy role for the state uh, as opposed to the private sector. All right, so again, sort of this, this striking statism that you find within the region. And, you know, it's interesting, if you look at public opinion, you ask 
citizens in Latin America, do you identify with the left, the right, or the center? Not many people identify with the left. Uh, and and it, during the so-called left turn since the late, 19, in late 1990s, you don't actually see more people saying they identify with the left. So what you see, however, is that people don't necessarily think of these issues in left-right terms. And what you find, I think, is that there are a large number of citizens who may not think of themselves as leftists, but may well be willing to support a party or a candidate that is running for an agenda that calls for a strong state role um, in, in the economy. And so I think that we have to be a little bit careful in, in using the data about the ideological self-placement of citizens in Latin America. I think this is also fairly striking. And it shows the same data, uh, but shown in a different way, whether people support state control or private ownership. And you find, especially when it comes um, to the social policy areas, education, healthcare, uh, you find overwhelming majorities of citizens who want the state playing a central role within that. It helps you understand the, the mass protest movements in Chile in recent years around education policies. Okay? Beyond public opinion then, trying to understand what I sometimes call the Polanyian backlash to the, you know, to the market reforms of the 80s and 90s. Um, the other dimension of this, of course, are the mass protest movements that erupt in a number of countries in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and of course, this is a context where organized labor as a social actor has, has dwindled in its, in its, um, in its political power. Uh, and you tend not to find organized labor as the central actor, the way in which it was historically, but you, gotta, you have a lot of new kinds of social actors that emerge within these protest cycles. The indigenous movements most prominently, of course, in Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, the unemployed workers, the Piquetero movement in Argentina the student movement in Chile in recent times. So in other words, non-class-based kinds of actors often playing a central role in these social protest movements. But again, the big, the big social explosions take place in the countries that go through this de-aligning process of market reform. This is just a table that shows the decline in trade unionization in the region. And what you see is that, is that organized labor is a shadow of, of what it was historically um, before the market reforms began in the 1980s, okay? The other dimension then of the aftermath period that is related to this growing social resistance, the so-called left turn. Uh, as I said, 11 different countries have elected a, a leftist center president. What's striking is that they've all been getting reelected as, as well. So it's not just that they've come into office, but uh, the only, so far the only, the only country that has, uh, where a re-election has not taken place was in Chile. Uh, and Bachelet obviously would have been re-elected had she been allowed to run. So it's really only a, a quirk of the, of the Chilean electoral laws that prevented uh, the Chilean socialists from being re-elected most recently. Uh, so it's not just the election of these leaders, but so, so far they have been systematically getting re-elected. That won't take place in Paraguay, of course. Now, in Paraguay, uh, you know, Fernando Lugo was, was just removed, sort of a, you know, whether it's an impeachment or a legislative coup is, is open to, to debate. All right, all right, the question then, how, how does this growing social resistance the, the market orthodoxy, what is, how does this express itself politically? All right, as first of all, in the de-aligning cases where you had the bait and switch market reforms, as I said before, you get the strongest mass protest movements taking place in this set of countries. These are the countries that I list there. Uh, in each case, you had mass protests that played a, a significant role in bringing presidents down. Uh, Venezuela was a little bit of a, a delayed action with the impeachment. Uh, but in all those cases, this is the, the gas wars and the water wars in Bolivia, the cycles of indigenous mobilization in Peru, the Piquetero movement uh, in Argentina, and the Caracaso in Venezuela. So these are the countries where you get the mass social explosions, all of those in countries that went through the bait and switch dynamic of market reform. In all of these countries, you get either partial or complete party system breakdowns, not only on the left, but also on the right. In fact, it's more consistent on the right. The six countries that I list as having bait and switch reforms, the main business-backed pro-market centrist or conservative party collapses in, in all six cases, right? The partisan right collapses in the aftermath of bait and switch reforms. In, in four of the six cases, the main party of the left also collapses. It gets outflanked on the left by, by Hugo Chavez, by Evo Morales, and the MAS in Bolivia, some sort of outsider populist movement. Only two, of the, only two of the bait and switch parties survive to remain major actors. The PLN in Costa Rica, which moves to the right and becomes the new conservative party, and the Peronists in Argentina, who veer back to the left and somehow 
alone in the region, they find a way to then channel the social resistance to market reforms, uh, absorbing part of the Piquetero movement. Right, so the Peronists have this extraordinary resiliency that is unparalleled in the region. They lead the market reforms in the 90s. They channel the social backlash against it in the aftermath period. No other party is able to pull that off in the region. In these countries, you also get more radical left turns. Uh, that takes place. You get the populist outsiders and the new political movements rather than institutionalized parties of the left uh, that, are, that lead the process of the left turn. These are the cases where, not in every case, but in, in all the cases where you rewrite the constitutions as part of the left turn, uh, you basically expressions of, uh, of popular sovereignty that takes place in plebiscitary mechanisms to bring about radical constitutional change. Uh, you also get more dramatic uh, economic policy change in these cases. So you get sharper departures, in other words, from the neoliberal model that takes place when you turn left in the aftermath to the bait and switch reforms. This is just, uh, you know, from the Heritage Foundation's so-called index of economic freedom. You see sort of the, you know, the, the market model as a, a, the regional average peaks in 2000 and then it's been coming down a bit since then. Virtually all of this decline, however, is accounted for by four cases. Um, and I'll show in, in just a, a moment here. All right, the four cases are Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, all cases that were part of the bait and switch dynamic of reform. And you see huge shifts away from the market model with, within those cases. Comparing them to Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay, where you also turn left, uh, but you turn left uh, through uh, through the institutionalized parties of the left in party systems that had been aligned programmatically during the critical juncture. And what you see is a very different kind of left turn, much more moderate in terms of its macroeconomic effects. So you, you see the leftist governments in those countries trying to address the social deficits, you know, some modest redistributive po policies, but relatively orthodox in terms of macroeconomic policies. Okay, so the, the legacies of aligning critical junctures then are quite different than the legacies of these de-aligning bait and switch critical junctures, right? Uh, in the countries that had aligning critical junctures, social protest has been much more moderate. You get much more stable electoral competition and you get much more moderate left turns that have occurred through the institutionalized parties. You don't rewrite constitutions. You don't, you don't see plebiscitary expressions of popular sovereignty within those cases. And you get modest redistributive reforms within a context of macroeconomic orthodoxy. So what does this mean then for, for party systems in the aftermath period? All right, ultimately what you see is increasing stability in the party systems that experience the aligning critical junctures. In other words, the, the long-term legacy of what I call contested liberalism uh, is relative stability in partisan competition, but you see high and increasing volatility in the party systems that experience both the neutral and the de-aligning critical junctures. I right, should just to try to show a little bit of this data here. This just looks at the Peterson index of volatility according to the kind of critical juncture. Uh, so the blue bar on the left are the countries that had aligning critical junctures. You see volatility fairly high in the 80s and 90s, but then coming down in the first decade of the, 20th, uh, of the 21st century. The, the red bar in the middle are the countries that had the neutral critical junctures. And you see average volatility increasing as you move into the first decade of the 21st century. And then the countries that had the de-aligning critical junctures, you see a huge jump in electoral volatility as you move from the 80s and 90s uh, to, the last, to the last decade. Uh, even more striking, I think, this is a different indicator that simply looks at the, the percentage uh, of, of the vote for new parties that are formed uh, in presidential and legislative elections uh, according to the kind of critical juncture. I'm not sure if you can see the colors here very effectively on, on the PowerPoint. Uh, but essentially, this looks at both presidential and legislative elections. This looks, the first set of bar graphs is for, the 19, is for 1990 to 2000. The second set is for 2000 to 2010. Um, and the first two bars here are the countries that, for both legislative and presidential elections, these are the cases that had aligning critical junctures. And then this is the same countries um, after 2000. And what you see is that essentially the party systems remain intact. What, what electoral volatility is there is simply switching votes from one established party to another. Uh, and essentially you, do, you don't get new parties emerging or outsider populist figures or some sort of alternative emerging in the countries that had aligning critical junctures, right? So they've been remarkably stable in terms of the core party system remaining intact. The middle bars in each set are the countries that had the neutral critical junctures. And what you see 
Still relatively stable in the 90s, but in the first decade of the 21st century, a huge jump in, in terms of the percentage of the vote that is going to new political parties in those cases. And then finally, the countries that had, uh, that had the de-aligning critical junctures, these two bars and then these two bars, where you see a huge vote, uh, a huge increase in the percentage of the vote that is going to Evo Morales, that is going to Hugo Chavez, Rafael Correa, all right, the other kinds of outsider figures. All right, so that graph then just, just shows yeah, uh, essentially uh, you know, how much of the vote is going to these new kinds of alternatives. This shows some of the same data, just looking at a couple of different countries to get a sense of how the dynamic works. Um, and it looks at, at El Salvador and Brazil. I include them because to come back to Maine Waring and Zoko, El Salvador and Brazil, which are these two cases, all right, these are brand new party systems in the 1980s. All right, they're formed during the third wave of democratization. According to Maine Waring and Zoko, they should be fragile, weak, inchoate, et cetera. What you see is that they've been highly resistant to the emergence of new outside, outside uh, al alternatives, right? So you get uh, tremendous stability in terms of, of their hold on the electorate. The other cases, you actually had more, more established, more traditional political parties, of course, especially in Venezuela, but also in Bolivia, you had the MNR. And these are the cases where you see this huge increase of the vote that takes place um, as voters are looking for new alternatives both on the left and the right, right? So those are cases that went through the bait and switch de-aligning dynamic of reforms and what you see then is that the party systems lose their capacity to hold on to the electorate in the aftermath period. All right, so this then tries to, you know, to show what are the longer term legacies of the critical junctures, whether or not they aligned or de-aligned the party systems and how they shaped competition in the aftermath period. So just to conclude, and I want to leave time for questions and answers, in terms of you know, what I've tried to show here is that stability and volatility are not, are not random across the region. I think we can identify patterns, but neither are stability and, and volatility strictly predetermined by the pre-existing strength of political parties coming into the critical juncture. If, if that were important, Venezuela would be, you know, Venezuela should be the most stable party system in the region if you look at what was in place going into the 1980s. Uh, so it's not predetermined by the, historic, by the historic strength of the parties or by the age of party systems when they were formed, right? So the arguments about the importance of having party systems formed during earlier stages of democratization does not appear to be as, as central as, as what Mainwaring and others have argued. Right, ultimately then what I'm saying is that stability and volatility have been, been highly conditioned by political dynamics within the critical juncture itself. It's what happens within the third wave, uh, not, not you know, the kinds of parties that were in place before you entered the third wave, but what happens within the third wave itself uh, that is very important. And then ultimately, the, I think the other lesson that stands out is the importance of programmatic competition for democratic representation, at least in contexts where popular sectors are capable of politicizing inequalities and politicizing social deficits. For the most part, they weren't able to, to politicize those social deficits in the context of the economic crisis uh, and structural adjustment in the 1980s and 1990s. Once you move into the aftermath period, however, the context changes and as popular sectors are able to politicize those inequalities, if you have party systems that are not programmatically aligned, uh, where you've got this neoliberal convergence around around the free market model, which you found was the party systems who were very poorly situated to respond to those kinds of societal pressures and societal demands. So ultimately, I guess so the bottom point is, you know, in the, in the 90s, we talked a lot about the Washington consensus that seemed to be stabilizing politics in a lot of the region. The legacies, the longer term legacies of the Washington consensus, when it really, when the Washington consensus was expressed in partisan terms, it proved to be highly destabilizing for partisan competition over the longer term. Um, so I think I will stop and leave it there and respond to any questions and comments that you may have. Five years ago, but is there a new stability coming in? Then a, a sort of 
different question would be, in the country, that it sounds like the sort of de-aligning ones were also the ones that experienced the harshest marketization processes, although maybe that's not your argument. But at any rate, it seems like if marketization leads to atomization of social actors, what then accounts for the ability of those social actors to act collectively in such a successful way in the aftermath period? It seems like that mm -hmm. is somewhat paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me respond to the first question first about you know, whether you see more stable patterns emerging in the aftermath period. Um, you, in some ways, the conditions would appear to be there to do that in the sense that you, know, you look at Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia, certainly in those three cases, you clearly have underlying social cleavages um, that clearly have programmatic or ideological expressions. And, you know, I mean, to go back to Lipson and Rokan, you know, you've got the social, social basis for relatively stable forms of partisan alignment. Um, I would argue that the left side of that cleavage has at least partially reconstituted itself in, in partisan forms, certainly in Bolivia. I mean, the MAS is, you know, has clearly emerged as a major new party of the left. It's a movement party in, in classic terms. Venezuela, you know, they're highly dependent on, you know, it's not clear, of course, what happens if Chavez um, were to pass away. Um, and of course, you know, his party remains highly dependent on, on Chavez himself. And it's not real clear just how institutionalized that is if something were to happen to Chavez. Ecuador, Correa started with absolutely no partisan base whatsoever. He has built what appears to be, he has certainly built a strong, you know, political uh, you know, political force that is, you know, they just captured a large majority within the Congress in elections a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there's at least been some reconstitution on the left side of that cleavage. What is extraordinary in the region is the incredible failure of conservative parties um, to mobilize, to organize their side of the cleavage. Um, I mean, the other side of the left turn that has gotten remarkably little attention is the, uh, the incredible failure of conservative pro-business, pro-market parties, not only to lead the process of market reforms in much of the region, but to capitalize politically on them uh, to defend the model in the electoral arena, or even, even when the class interests of business are clearly threatened, as you could probably argue that they are in some of those cases that I mentioned, the, you know, the failure to or organize a strong new party of the right in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Venezuela. I mean, you've got a, there, there, there's an opposition coalition that has mobilized against Chavez now. And even, of course, the, you know, there's substantial social mobilization against Chavez at the beginning of the, of the, you know, the early 2000s. But their inability to convert that into partisan expression is dramatic. And I would argue as dependent as Chavismo is on Chavez, we don't know if his coalition will hold if he were to die, but I would bet you anything that the opposition coalition will fragment much more quicker than what Chavismo will fragment if Chavez disappears. The, the only thing that holds the opposition together is their antipathy for Chavez. And without Chavez, you have complete atomization of, of conservative politics, I think, in Venezuela. So the inability, and I think, and, and, uh, you know, it's striking to me. I mean, you can say historically where you see strong new conservative parties emerge, it's in countries where the class interests of business were directly threatened. Iran and El Salvador, the UDI in Chile, perhaps you're seeing this, you know, the Partido de la U in Colombia. What's striking in all of those cases, the, the only strong new conservative parties you see in the region are in countries where the new conservative parties had extra electoral social networks coming directly out of the coercive apparatus. The death squads in El Salvador, the paramilitaries in Colombia, and Pinochet's municipal apparatus for the UDI in Chile. Right? But purely electoral conservative parties have been extraordinarily unsuccessful. In, in recent years, uh, where they don't have those coercive networks to draw from. And so ultimately, you know, my hunch is that electoral volatility may come down a little bit this decade compared to the last couple of decades. Um, but you're not, we're not seeing party systems reconstituting themselves in the aftermath of collapses. Where they've collapsed, and there are, there are five countries where I would argue we've seen a collapse, um, they've not reconstituted, at least not more than one side of the cleavage has been configured in either of them. And you also see, I mean, in Argentina, the inability of the anti-Peronist bloc to congeal politically is, is quite striking as well. Um, so ultimately, you know, I don't have, you know, it's not clear to me why the conservative side of the spectrum appears to be incapable of organizing in partisan terms, but I think it's a strong pattern in the region.
In terms of the revival of collective action on the part of social actors, you know, what's striking, of course, is that, as I mentioned, organized labor, you know, they're there, they're part of these mobilizations, but it's new social actors um, that have emerged in contexts where you don't have uh, an institutionalized partisan left in opposition that can channel the social, the social pressures. You do sometimes see it expressed in these, in these, you know, these mass forms. Um, and certainly the, prep, the, the ability of indigenous communities to provide a social basis for that is the story in some places. But that's not the story in Argentina. I mean, the Picatero movement comes out of these networks of, of unemployed, uh, unemployed people. And um, you, know, you see a capacity of, at least episodically, for new social actors to converge uh, in periods of mass protests. Um, my hunch, I mean, for the most part, that's well, I mean, it's continued in recent times in Chile. It's the student movement, of course, in recent years. I mean, for the most part, the big protest cycle occurred in the, in the early aftermath period, the late 90s, early 2000s, where Argentina, Ecuador, and Bolivia all had these social explosions. We really haven't seen that since the left turn has gotten underway, um, with the exception of Chile, which I think has a little bit different cycle with, with the student protests. Um, but, uh, you know, in general, yeah, I mean, I think in general, sort of the, the weakening of organized collective action on the part of popular sectors is still an important part of the story in much of the region. You know, it's, it's really only a handful of cases where you do get these, these episodic explosions, and I think those correspond to certain political moments and the ability to, you know, to, to channel discontent at those moments. But the kind of sustained popular collective action that you saw historically with organized labor at the center of it, that's really not something that you see in a sustained way in most of the region, with the exception of Bolivia. I mean, Bolivia clearly, I, I would argue that Bolivia, social movements have literally taken state power. Now, social movements, of course, find it very difficult to exercise state power. So you're seeing the, frag, you know, the fragmentation of it that takes place. But clearly, strong popular actors have emerged and sustained themselves there. The, the inability, even in Ecuador, I mean, Ecuador, you had you know, an indigenous movement with, you know, at the heart of broader forms of collective action, they toppled three consecutive elected presidents. Um, but the movement has largely dissolved. Um, since the closer they came to power, the, the, more, frag the, the more they lost their political coherence. Um, and so I think that, that ultimately the, the difficulties of, of engaging in sustained collective action remains an important part of the story in the region. Yes, David. I like your opening motivating puzzle about regime stability, party instability, but do remember the old Litz argument that parliamentary systems are much more stable at the regime level because they can be unstable at the governmental level, whereas presidential systems are rigid at the governmental level, which can trigger regime instability. So that can, that can cut two ways. Yeah, yeah. No, it could be the case, and um, you know what's what ultimately what what explains this puzzle. Uh, you know what, what you see in, in part is I think where where party systems have broken down. I mean the countries that have had difficulty uh, in terms of maintaining the stability of the democratic order. It's essentially the you know for the most part the countries that have gone through this this dealining bait and switch pattern where you get the social explosions and so you know the cases where you do get sort of the refounding of democratic regimes. That's Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia again, where you get these, these expressions of popular sovereignty. And, you know, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not a break with democracy in the sense that, you know, but it's, it's a break with the pre-existing regime in the sense that you're refounding the constitutional order. Uh, and of course, that's taken place in a context of sort of hyper-presidentialism, where you get uh, the emergence of, of new, you know, generally populist kinds of figures that, you know, that become expressions of popular sovereignty, of, of movements that have really mobilized against the pre-existing democratic regimes and against party systems that had failed to channel the kinds of social opposition that existed there. So yeah, could be. Yeah, I should think I'll have to I should think more about that and see if it's something I that I want to develop. Okay. Yes. Allison. Um, so two questions about kind of two of the mechanisms that are underlying the, the argument. I think it's it's at a at a sort of very abstract level, does a wonderful job of pressing culture and complexity in terms of changes in our time. So the first is when we see um, the the right collapse when the left implements a reform, why why does that occur exactly? Is it simply that the platform's stolen and therefore there's no kind of organizing principle or something else going on? Um, 
And secondly, does how the neoliberal reforms or structural adjustments implemented actually influence the way this process unfolds over time? And I would think of the how in two respects. One is with respect to the efficacy, or even how long it takes uh, for things like uh, attempts to deal with hyperinflation to actually bite, or um, uh, the efficacy of the regulation of privatized entities. Does that influence at all the results? Mm -hmm. And secondly, the, the targeting of these programs. It, are losses of employment targeted to particular constituencies? Uh, are there subsidies introduced that maybe alleviate the effects of, of some of these reforms, et cetera? And how does that, does that influence at all the way the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, way the aftermath plays out? Or is this purely a, a story about you know, rising unemployment, the structural adjustment will always sort of generate the, you know, similar effects across, across cases? And the, the variable then that really matters is are the ones that, that you've identified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're interesting questions. I, I've puzzled over this question of the mechanisms of the, the demise of the right. Because, I mean, it's, as I said, in the six cases that I code as bait and switch, the, the main conservative party, you know, it's Cope in Venezuela. You know, it's, you know, um, you know, in some cases, these are not necessarily real strong, highly institutionalized conservative parties. But, well, you know, the radical party, the radical party is not a conservative party in Argentina. Um, but it was, you know, clearly close to business interests and the alternative to the Peronists. And it's a remarkably consistent pattern that when, when, the, his, when the historic populist or center left party moves to the right and implements the free market model, the right basically dissolves. Now, part of that story may simply be that. You know that middle and upper classes that you know that like the reforms, you know, approve of it. That you know, I mean, so, you know, the Peronist Party did begin to attract more votes in the 90s from, you know, from from middle class groups within Argentina. So that may be part of the story, um, you know. But part of it, I think, is simply that, you know, I I don't know. I mean, I my sense is that, I th I think business communities tend not to like partisan politics in general. Um, and certainly in, in Latin America, I think business elites would much prefer to call up the Ministry of the Economy and, ha and invite them for lunch if they got something that concerns them, rather than working through a partisan intermediary. And they would much rather uh, hedge their bets and have fluid access to whatever party is in power, rather than investing in a particular party organization. And I think they tend to invest in a particular party organization when they do feel that the class interests have been threatened. So that's why I say Arena and Chile, you know, El Salvador and Chile, you do see strong conservative parties emerging where there is that kind of direct threat. But I think in a context where your historic adversaries are implementing the economic model that you want to see, all right, when, when the Peronists are doing it, when Acción Democrática is doing it, um, you know, what, what incentives do middle and upper classes have to really invest in conservative party organization? You know, I think that in a sense there's, there's uh, they, in it, I don't know whether they become you know, uh, you know, infatuated with the Washington consensus themselves, or there's sort of a sense that, you know, that this model is driven by global market constraints. There's no alternative. Why do we need partisan intermediaries when, when no matter who gets elected, we're going to get what we want? Um, and so I think there's a certain element of that, you know, that it may be very short-sighted. I mean, I think, you know, they're paying the consequences for this underinvestment in party organization now, where you see they're not able to compete in the electoral arena. Um, but it is a very striking pattern that the conservative parties break down where bait and switch takes place. Um, and, and I don't have a clear explanation of the mechanism for that, but you know I can sort of speculate as to you know some of the factors that may be there. In terms of does it matter how the reforms take place? You know, are they more successful, more efficient? You know, are there forms of social compensation that are built into the process? I've I've thought a lot. You know, for a long time I've been working on this project for, for much longer than I care to admit, and I always assumed I always assumed that there had to be something about the nature of the reform process and whether it was successful or how deep it was. But you find, you know, you find in the bait and switch breakdown category, you've got really deep reformers like Argentina and Bolivia. Argentina and Bolivia were absolute showcases of the neoliberal model in the 1990s. I mean, they had hyperinflation, they, they did the reforms, they stabilized. I mean, they were of the international financial community, absolute showcases. Whereas Venezuela and, and Ecuador, I mean, Ecuador would drag their feet. And they, I mean, every government for 20 years tried to do it in Ecuador, and none did it very effectively. But they end up in the same category. Venezuela, they tried it under Carlos Andres Perez, and you know, there's a backlash, and they tried it again. 
you know, you know, eight years later, and 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 they end up with Hugo Chavez. So I mean, you get you get the backlash both in the cases that had very deep aggressive reforms and in cases where you had more partial reforms, more intermittent patterns. So you get it where you get shocks, you get it where you get more intermittent patterns. It's not real clear, but I think it does matter. I mean, the, I mean, the other bait and switch case that I didn't say much about, of course, is Costa Rica. Um, now, you don't get the social explosion uh, in Costa Rica. You do get a, a, the conservative party falls apart, and the PLN moves to the right, and you get a new populist left that emerges. So some, at least, you know, there's a partial party system breakdown, even in Costa Rica, which we tend not to pay any attention to. Um, but I think it does, I think the Costa Rican case, I would argue, that, that the nature of the market reform process, it was not a shock. Um, and, and they always left in place a good part of the social welfare state that, that Costa Rica is historically known for. They did not shred it. Um, there was some, some paring back that takes place, but it was more macroeconomic reform that occurs um, without sort of the deep cuts in, uh, and the sort of the, the heavy social consequences that you did get in some of the other cases. So I think it does matter, and I think that's why you see the effects more moderated in the Costa Rican case than in, in some of the other cases. So I, I think that there is something to the argument. But I've tried to, to think as to whether there's something more systematic about the nature of the reform process itself. And, and as I look at it, the cases don't align you know, to show me real consistent patterns. So the only thing that really, the only consistent pattern that I was able to come up with is what I talked about. It's sort of, it's the simple notion of who leads the reform process. Is it conservatives or is it you know, a historic populist party? And then do you have a major party of the left in opposition? So it's basically this notion of the reform alignment, the alignment of parties, uh, of partisan competition around the free market reforms that I think seems to have a more consistent effect. Yes? <laughs> Yeah. Now the, the Mexican case is real interesting because of course the PRI, you know, the PRI is the party that does market reform and that is, you know, without question a historic labor-based populist party. Um, what's different about Mexico, you know, the critical juncture hits Mexico in the early 1980s with the debt crisis. And at that point, we have to remember that the PRI was still very much a hegemonic party. Uh, in fact, they had like 80% of the vote, uh, you know, in the late 70s, early, 19, early 1980s. And what takes place then is fairly early in the critical juncture, sort of the first stages of the market reforms before the deepest reforms that take place under Salinas, the PRI splits in 1986. Um, and essentially then the PRD is formed as an opposition party of the left. And so at that point, the PRI is you know, clearly becoming a more conservative party. You still have the pawn further to the right, so there's a more ideologically pure conservative party there. But essentially, once the PRI splits and you hive off the PRD, you essentially have an aligning dynamic of reform. All right? You've got sort of a center-right party in the PRI. You've got a conservative party, the PAN, supporting market reforms. And you have the PRD as an opposition party that, that is able to, to moderate the kinds of effects. So I argue that the Mexico, although they begin bait and switch, that the logic of the division of a hegemonic party creates a major opposition party of the left that, that provides at least some outlet for, for dissent in the party system. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but I wanted to thank Professor Roberts for joining us today, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.